This is the sixth lecture for MA 1012 at University College Cork. In this lecture, we're going to think about infinite sums. First, we need good notation to write infinite sums. Instead of writing, well, let's start with finite sums. It becomes uh, tedious to write already for finite sums like this, such a long thing. So it's convenient to write it as the sum, so sigma for the Greek, uh, the Greek letter sigma to represent the word sum, uh, and then we'll write it uh, something like i equals um, 1 to 6. It means start at 1, and then i goes up 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So i takes the values 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. And then we'll just write a sub i. So plug in i is 1, plug in i is 2, plug in i is 3, 4, 5, and then stop at 6. You start here at 1, you go up, 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 all the way to 6. Starting at 1, ending at 6. Calculating the value of a sub i with i being 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, up to 6. And that's this guy. So it's a convenient notation in which to write sums. It just saves a lot of, a lot of uh, ink. But... Um, it becomes helpful, especially when we ha don't even know how many terms there are in the sum. So, for example, i equals 1 to, whoops, uh, 1 to uh, capital N, a sub i. That means a1 plus a2 plus a3 plus dot, 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 all the way up to a n minus 1 plus a n, where we stop at i equals n sum abstract number which we don't know what we haven't even, I haven't even said what it is just some presumably some positive integer um, maybe I shouldn't use the letter I actually I noticed the notes don't use the letter I here the notes would say something like n equals 1 to capital N a sub little n it note that this is what's called a dummy variable Why is it a dummy variable? Because inside this expression for this sum, we have a meaningful little n value that was starting at 1, going up, 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 all the way to capital N. Um, maybe it's easier to see in this example, starting at 1 and going up to 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Uh, so those are our, 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 our dummy uh, values, our values of i. i is thought of as a dummy variable because inside the summation sign, it makes sense to talk about the value of i because i is going... Uh, according to the summation sign from 1 to 6, we can calculate things in terms of i inside here. But outside here, it wouldn't make sense. There is no letter i outside here because it only exists inside the summation expression, inside this guy, whatever this um, uh, sigma sign is covering. It covers this, this expression here, and in this expression we get to use the, the letter i. So as a simple example, if we were to calculate out the sum, uh, let's say j equals 1 to 3 of j squared, what would that mean? We'd set j equal to 1 first and calculate this expression with j equal to 1, 1 squared. Then we add on the summation signs here, this, the sigma sign says sum, so add on, that's a sum. The word sum does not mean a uh, mathematical expression as it often is used in Ireland. It means sum, uh, to add things. A sum is when you add things. A difference is when you take uh, one thing and subtract another. A product is when you multiply things. A sum doesn't mean a mathematical expression. It means an adding of terms. So this is a sum, so it must have a plus sign in it. Okay, so then we put in j equals 2. Um, and when we plug in j equals 2, we get 2 squared. And then we add, because it's, again, a sum. And then when we have the j equals 3, put in 3 squared, that's j equals 3. So we plug in the value j, you know, 1, 2, and 3, plug them into here, into this j squared. So we take the values j is 1, 2, 3, it says, and then plug them into j squared and add up. That's j is 1, 2, 3, add it up. And so if you add those up, you get an answer of 1 squared is 1, 2 squared is 4, 3 squared is 9, 9 and 1 is 10, so it gives me 14. Okay, so we can see how to do the summation. How do we use the symbol? What does it mean to add up infinitely many numbers? If I were to try to, let's not even use the fancy notation, if I were to try to add up uh, infinitely many numbers going on forever, what would I mean by that? Um, intuitively, uh, it, it means something, but what? So what we'll define it to mean 
uh, is that it means um, the limit of, you just add up one of the numbers the first time, and then the next time you try, you, you add up the first two numbers, and then the next time you try, you add up the first three of the numbers, and so on and so forth. And you see what limit that goes to. It goes to some limit. Uh, some limit. And that's the limit we'll call the sum of all the numbers. A, N. N is 1 to infinity. So this guy is the sum n equals 1 to 1 of a single number a n. This is the sum n equals 1 to 2 of the a n's. And this is the sum n equals 1 to 3 of the a n's, and so on. So we take the the numbers, uh, one, one of them, two of them, three of them. We try adding up. We add up in all these ways and keep going and going until we get uh, drift that drifting in, hopefully, towards some limit. And that's what we'll call this infinite sum. So if you had to do this on a computer, what you'd imagine is you'd get the computer to calculate out the first very large number of values of the ANs and add them up. And if it had calculated out the first million or billion or trillion, you'd hope that that'd be enough that you'd get a pretty good approximation to the final limiting answer. So the abstract theory is that we'll say that, a, uh, that a, an infinite sum converges, uh, a sum, infinite sum, converges. If we have a formal expression giving infinite sum, we'll say it converges if that limit exists. So what was that limit? That limit is as we add up not all the terms, but just a very large number of them, and make the large number become a very, very, very large and get larger and larger and larger. Um, uh, uh, converges. Uh, and, uh, and then we define uh, uh, then if that happens, then we'll define the sum, the infinite sum, is defined to be the li this limit. So that gives us a well-defined notion of being um, the limit of an infinite sequence of numbers, how to add up infinitely many numbers. Here's a rather tricky one um, that's given in the notes. Um, suppose we wanted to work out um, this sum n equals 1 to infinity, 1 over n times n plus 1. Um, there are probably many ways to do this. We want to try and show its conversion and actually figure out what the sum must be. Um, one trick to do it is to note that if we took 1 over n squared minus 1 over n plus 1 squared, that would give us um, a numerator of, sorry, 1 over, what am I saying, 1 over n times 1 over n plus 1. Um, that's better. Then um, we get a, a, a numerator of, let's see, n plus 1 minus n over n times n plus 1 um, is 1 over n times n plus 1. You'd have to have somehow thought of that um, without making a mistake that I'd made there. Um, and, uh, and then you could see how to make the sum work out. If you take the partial sums, 1 to capital N, 1 over n times n plus 1, you get, uh, by using this identity here, you get the sums n equals 1 to capital N, 1 over n minus 1 over n plus 1. That gives you um, a sum n equals 1 to capital N, 1 over n, minus a sum n equals 1 to capital N, 1 over little n plus 1. And those are basically the same sum. I'm just going to write this in terms of n plus 1 instead of n. So n equals 1 to n, 1 over n. Now if I change this to n plus 1, this starts at one n, little n is 1, this starts at 1 over 2. So let's try and start it at 2. And then when n, little n is capital N, you get capital N plus 1. So let's make it end at capital N plus 1, 1 over n. Um, so this is a very clever telescoping sum trick, which you might not think of. Um, and so all the terms cancel, because it's exactly the same, two same sums, except they differ at where they start. This guy has an extra factor of little n equals 1, where this only starts at 2. And then this guy uh, ends at n, this guy ends at n plus 1. So you're left with... Uh, term here from n equals 1, 1 over 1, minus the term here from n, little n equals capital N plus 1, 1 over capital N plus 1, and all the other terms vanish, because this guy, little n equals 2, cancels with this guy, little n equals 2, and so on and so on, all the way up, 
at capital N here, capital N canceling with little n is capital N here. So you get this. So the partial sums of the of the thing approach a limit. This obviously approaches one. All right, so that shows that it converges. So it converges uh, to one. And so we can write that in our notation as saying the sum of one over n times n plus one is one. We can look at complex number examples as well. If we think about the example of uh, uh, the series of sums uh, k equals one to infinity of uh, i to the k, what does that look like? Um, well, i to the zero is one is is one. Sorry, but we're not really doing i to the zero. We're starting at one anyway. i to the one is one is i. I to the 2 is i squared is minus 1. i cubed multiplied by another i, so it becomes minus i. And then i to the 4th is 1 again. And it just repeats. Um, i to the 5th is i. i to the 6th is minus 1. i to the 7th is minus i, and so on and so forth. It repeats, 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 repeats every 4. It goes up to, goes from 1, 1, 1, 1, and then one, then we add four and get five, and get back again, and then so if I do one plus four, one plus uh, four plus four, and so on and so forth, I'll always get i's here, and so on. It'd be minus ones and minus i's here. So we're just going to end up adding these things with our partial sums, and so um, when we look at the partial sums, so let's write out what this thing is as an infinite sum. It's the sum of uh, i plus i squared plus i cubed plus i to the fourth plus da 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 da. But when we go through the partial sums, every time every do we sometimes do four of them, we get back to where we started. So if we add these together, we'll get that plus that is zero, that plus that is zero. So we get zero every time we add four of them. But if we add just one, if we add let's let S N be the sum of i plus i squared plus dot 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 plus i to the n. Um, we'll find that every time we do four of them, we repeat. So we get s1 is i, s2 is adding the um, i and minus i1, i minus 1, s3 is i minus i cancel, and so you get minus 1. Um, and then S4, the fourth uh, guy, is you add an I onto this guy, and so you should get, sorry, you add S4, you add I to the fourth is I, so you should get zero, I think. Um, yeah, so then, uh, and then it just repeats. S5, uh, S6, S7, S8, they just equal, equal equal, equal, just to what they were before, because the numbers are repeating over and over again. That's going to be i, i minus 1, minus 1, and 0, and so on and so forth. So the partial sums repeat and repeat and repeat. They never settle down into any final limit behavior. They just keep going back and forth between these four values, and so they never head in toward a limit. So it is divergent because the partial sums aren't heading in toward something. So in general, what has to happen is these partial sums have to head in toward some limiting value. Now, um, so some other examples that you might be able to, hopefully you can you can work out on your own. Suppose we take some non-zero number, and we consider the sequence a r, a, well, sorry, a, a r, a r squared, a r cubed, a r to the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and so on, the geometric series. That was the geometric sequence. That's this guy. So the geometric series, as it's called, is the sum of those. Is the sum of those a uh, plus a r plus a r squared plus a r cubed plus da 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 dot. Um, so, uh, and I'll leave you to convince yourself that the answer is not that hard to find. It's actually a over 1 minus r if uh, the magnitude of r is less than 1 and it's uh, divergent otherwise. So you could try and work out why that's true as an exercise. 
A, a simple test for divergence, a very naive one, um, simply is that the terms have to get small in order to, to that the thing can drift in toward a value, that the sum can drift in toward a value. Um, if uh, the sum uh, an exists, then uh, the terms uh, have to get closer and closer. The, the partial sums have to get closer and closer to some value. They differ by the elements of the sequence. And so uh, the elements of the sequence must go to zero. In other words, by this, this simple expression, I mean that the limit as n goes to infinity, a n is equal to zero. I'll often write that as a n goes to zero. Um, so uh, the proof the proof is is fairly uh, obvious. Um, so uh, so that's a way we can show that that a, that a limit doesn't exist. Um, conversely, uh, if the a n do not go to zero, if they do anything else then um, they approach any other value or don't approach a value at all uh, in the limit, then um, the sum uh, of the ans does not, well, it diverges. It's a divergence. So it's a test for convergence, and the proof is essentially obvious that the uh, the partial sums um, a1 plus da, 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 plus a n have to go into some, uh, some limit. Um, but that means that uh, the differences have to get very small. So the difference between that guy and, say, uh, this guy um, also goes to the same limit. Uh, so if m and n are chosen to be very, bar very large, as they become larger and larger, the difference has to go to zero. Uh, has to go to zero. And we can, in particular, set m uh, to be n plus 1. It can be anything that gets big. And so we can then just say that means, therefore, that a n plus 1 has to go to 0. Or I could have made it n minus 1, I suppose. Um, so then uh, th then we can get uh, the, the terms have to go to 0. So that's intuitively reasonably clear. The terms have to get tinier and tinier and tinier if they're so going to add up to some finite limiting sum. Y you might wonder if maybe it goes the other way around as well. Um, if the terms do go to 0, then uh, does the, the the sum actually uh, exist, or does it converge to some limit? And the answer is no in general, but it's a bit subtle. Um, it's a bit tricky to come up with a good example. Um, one one simple example, but not all that easy to, to prove, um, is this one, 1 over n which simply means it's 1 over 1 plus 1 over 2 plus 1 over 3 plus 1 over 4 plus dot, 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 dot. The terms individually are getting very small, but if you and if you calculate this sum up to, say, the first 10,000 terms or 100,000 terms, it doesn't get all that large, but it does eventually exceed any, any value. It will grow to infinity. When you try and add up all the terms, it becomes infinitely large. We won't need to prove this at the moment, but uh, it's not terribly difficult to prove using, using calculus. Once you have uh, proven something to be convergent, lots of other things are automatically forced to be convergent. Um, so it's an easy uh, thing to prove that if you have a non-zero constant, and if uh, the sum, an infinite sum, uh, converges, then uh, all multiples of it converge. You just add up the multiples, and they add up to the multiple. Uh, with um, the sum of the um, multiples being the multiple of the sum. Um, and also it works for diverges instead of converges. Um, diverges instead of converges. What do I want? Die instead of con. Um, uh, and die instead of con. So it also works there. In our next lecture, we'll talk about the most important example uh, examples of, of these infinite series, the so-called power series, which play a vital role in every area of application of mathematics.